present. So, welcome to Big Websites for Small Screens, the ICANN.org case study. Uh, if you are not intending to learn about responsive web design and the ICANN.org case study, and you are here to learn about something completely different, you're in the wrong room. Personal introductions. Chris, could you introduce yourself? Uh, hi, I'm Chris Rupel. I'm a developer at Four Kitchens here, front end developer. Um, I am uh, leading all of the efforts for mobile web development and responsive design and stuff like that here. Um, I really dig JavaScript and uh, Drupal and the semantic web while we're at it because it's awesome. And that's me. And my name is Todd. I'm a partner at Four Kitchens. Um, I'm a designer, UX person. I love mobile. And in a previous life, I was a writer and editor. Zach. Howdy. I'm Zach. Um, I am 4K alumni. I'm currently working at uh, South by Southwest. I specialize in UX design um, and, and uh, implementation in mobile web also. So today. This is what we're going to cover. First, we're going to take a look at the business goals and technical requirements behind this project. When I say technical requirements, we're going to limit that to how it affected our design of the site. What we will not be covering is how we handled the really enormous migration challenge, although, um, Mark, if you could raise your hand. Why not, right? <laughs> they didn't pick the session. That's why not. And they're going to regret it someday. Boo. So um, we, had, we had a major, major migration challenge that we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. But several other people who are on the team working on this site. Actually, if you could raise your hands if you worked on the ICANN.org site. All right, we got some other people who can maybe answer some questions. So if you do have technical questions about migration and server architecture and things like that, uh, you may be able to talk to them after the session. But we will not be covering that here. This will be limited to design and the responsive mobile experience. So we're going to talk about IA, UX, and visual design, that whole design process and workflow. We're going to talk about how we then implemented those designs using various technologies, JavaScript, things like that, media queries. <clears throat> and then we're going to take your questions, because uh, we know that you're going to have some. So business goals, this is where I come in. When we worked with ICANN at the very beginning of the project, uh, we had to identify a handful of business goals for the site. We want to always identify business goals up front because business goals drive every decision we make, whether they're creative or technical, content related. Um, we want to make sure that all, everything that we do has their business goals in mind. So the first business goal that they identified was they needed to build a stable, dynamic site. ICANN.org, who is not familiar with ICANN, the organization? Okay. Briefly, ICANN, and this is a gross oversimplification, ICANN essentially runs the internet. ICANN is the organization that gets 17 or 18 cents or so of every domain registration that you purchase. And that fee goes to fund this nonprofit organization that handles the very complicated political, geopolitical, technological hurdles of making sure that every domain name links to an IP address on the internet. So they are very important, right? And their website, uh, unfortunately, had been a static, uh, by hand maintained site since it was first launched, probably in 1993. I'm assuming they were one of the earliest websites launched. Uh, but since about early 90s, it had been all done by hand in various iterations, and it had built up a ton, a ton of content. Um, Moving this content into a dynamic system like a content management system, specifically Drupal, was a huge, huge win for them. So just doing that was really, really big. They wanted to make sure that they could maintain their website using modern technologies like a CMS. That was their first business goal. Stop editing HTML files and uploading them to a server. They also wanted to update their visual design. They wanted to do a complete refresh of not necessarily their branding, but definitely the look and feel of the website and everything about their web presence. They want to make sure that their visitors do what they want to do and get what they need when they come to the site as quickly as possible. <clears throat> the audiences the, uh, that they're serving on the site, um, we identified something like five or six personas. There were members of the press who need to be able to get information about new top level domains that are issued. So if you ever wondered who came up with .com and why is there not a .whatever, I can. ICANN controls the top level domain, domains, the TLDs. It's the thing after the dot at the end. Uh, so there were a lot of changes recently to how the system works. 
that allows uh, individuals or entities to buy an entire TLD. So theoretically, Coca-Cola could come along and say, I want to buy dot Coca-Cola and, and be in charge of then issuing all domain names within dot Coca-Cola. So that's now basically open to the public. The fee is very hefty, but um, that's something that, that they control. So they have uh, journalists and people who are interested in that information, but they also have people who are on some of the governing committees, and they have many, many government, governing committees, international committees and people who handle technology and things like that. Um, so there are also, though, uh, and, and this was perhaps um, not their largest audience, as identified by traffic, but the most urgent, were people who had domain name disputes. So if you have ever lost a domain name to a squatter, or something expired and you had to get it back, but you felt you had rightful ownership to it, this was one of the organizations that you could go to and seek help from. So they needed to definitely identify, hey, do you need help? Are you not a committee member? Are you not interested in TLDs? Are you somebody who just has a problem and is really scared because now your website is down because your website expired or your domain name expired? So they, want, <laughs> they wanted to grab those people up front. They really wanted to enhance the, uh, their image as a multinational organization. Uh, which they are, but they wanted to make sure that that was upfront. They wanted to highlight multilingual content. They wanted to emphasize that this is a global organization that is working for a global internet. Uh, one of the phrases that they use internally to describe their mission is one world, one internet. There are places in the world that have their own internet in a way that is firewalled off or controlled or censored or something. They want to um, help protect that from, uh, uh, they want to help prevent that from happening. They also want to enable users from all over the world access the website using a variety of devices. So there are two key things built in there. Uh, variety of devices, that's one thing, right? So tablets, iPhones, Android phones, Blackberries, um, laptops, desktops, all of that stuff. But all over the world is, uh, what is not apparent when you first hear that is you're dealing with different levels of bandwidth and types of connectivity. So here, of course, we think, oh, we have an internet connection, it's broadband, I have DSL, I have cable, I have you know, something like that. Uh, there are places in the world that do not have broadband. There are many places in the United States that do not have broadband. Um, rural areas that still have dial-up. So when they say all over the world, they're talking about some parts of the world that rely exclusively on mobile data to be able to access the internet at all. They're doing it through a feature phone, they're doing it through something like that. And then finally, they wanted to clearly and concisely explain what ICANN is and why it matters. Because it is a complicated idea, and they wanted everything in their website and design to reinforce that. So then we had to identify technical requirements. And these are different than business goals, because technical requirements uh, force us to make certain decisions about the architecture within constraints that they set technically. Not goals, not things they want to achieve, but actual constraints that are in place. So for example, we had to use their existing server cluster. Um, they had, um, I think they had purchased some servers, I, I forget exactly, but they had, um, they have an in-house IT team. We definitely needed to work with them and we needed to make their, um, their servers work. They also had a Google search appliance. So we knew that we were gonna be using Google search appliance for search results. We absolutely had to provide multilingual support and all of the technical challenges that go along with that. And we had to migrate content without any change to structure or broken URLs. This website had 40, 4, 0, 1,000 static HTML files that had to be migrated into Drupal. And uh, in the end, Mark, how long did it take the script to run? Uh, it wasn't long. Uh, a few minutes? Half an hour. Half an hour. So we finally got this process down to countless edge cases and parsing text. I mean, this was literally going, opening every file, trying to figure out the date of that blog post using all kinds of metadata or the file date on the file or all kinds of complicated things. We got it down to 40,000 static HTML files, cleaned up, parsed, some archived away, some put into Drupal in about half an hour. And that took several months to do. So if you want to learn about that, you can maybe talk to Mark. Sorry to volunteer you for that. But we will not be covering the um, amazing technical challenges behind that uh, in this hour. <clears throat> we identified certain mobile devices that we had to support. So we worked with a client to create um, uh, this list, and this is what we worked off of. So Android 2.2, iOS 4.1, RAM BlackBerry, Windows Mobile, Symbian, and so on. Likewise, we had to support certain modern browsers. And hallelujah, IE6 and IE7 were not on the list, but IE8 still was. So there were still a lot of challenges, um, namely lack of support for media queries. So we could support modern browsers, but luckily we didn't have to worry about the really, really bad ones. 
So, Zach? I didn't want to like mispronounce that. That would have been sure. epically awesome. Hi, everybody. I'm Zach. Um, I would like to say before I get started that um, this project was a, a huge collaborative, a collaborative effort, and every decision that um, I made or that we made as a group uh, was constantly pinged back and forth. So when I'm talking about uh, the wireframes or why we did certain things, I, I wanted to be very clear that like I wasn't in some vacuum. It was constantly talking with the rest of my teammates, going over technical goals, uh, pinging the client who was incredibly responsive and helped us. It was really actually very freeing to have somebody who was very aggressive and gave us answers when we needed them and pointed us in the direction that we needed to take. So I'm going to try this thing and see how it goes. Yes. Okay. So where do you start when you're remapping something this incredible? You have to start with the AI, or the IA, ha ha ha. Map existing website and uh, identify all the content, and then re-architect that content, and then identify some content for archiving or deletion. And just as Todd just explained, and all the effort that Mark and uh, other members of our team went through in doing that migra migration, we started out by creating a, uh, a simple website, uh, or excuse me, a simple site map of what their link structure looked like, I don't know if you can see the little dotted lines that spider across, but essentially this is the navigation that the users were experiencing. There were obviously clear sections that they had labeled, but, um, and this is kind of hard to tell maybe from the diagram at certain distances, but those blue, uh, those blue items indicate links that are, say, like mainline link label that links to some other section in the website. So, for example, for instance, you could click on something that says blah, 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 resources, and as a user, when I clicked on that, it would take me to slash about some other thing. So there'd be a lot of jostling back and forth. And so we, we, went, we went through the entire old site and experienced it at the user's level and mapped that experience so that we could sort of decode all the things that we might have to deal with. And of course, there were tons of little things that we uh, eventually cleaned up that were edge case things that we missed and things that we added, but I'll get to that in a second. So that's kind of an idea of the, the fun that we had uh, doing that. Uh, then we moved on to re-architecting all that, creating new silos, creating new sections, relabeling everything, giving uh, new names to everything. Um, we actually uh, worked very closely with the client in different stages to get this uh, picture created. And he was very hands-on with it. It was really great to have uh, Mark S. in the room with us to um, say, you know, this needs to go here because of this. And we got really good uh, buy-in from his, his stakeholders, obviously, who are a part of that. Um, so this, this wireframe represents the new hierarchy, the new architecture that keeps everything where it's supposed to be, and if there are outliers, they're very specific to some uh, organization or group. And it also uh, illustrates some of the uh, external link systems that we had for like their uh, groups and their social media contacts. Oh yeah, there's more. <clears throat> so then after you get done doing all of that information architecture, which in itself is a bear, um, we move on to wireframing, like how, how is the user going to see this site? And we built wireframes for all the devices in parallel. And when I say all the devices, we set three breakpoints in sizes. So just kind of like three general sizes. You've got your desktop, so it's like 959 pixels wide plus. Then you've got, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, 640 to 700 range, so like tablet in a, in a portrait view. And then the 320 to 480, which is like uh, your iPhone or Android, so something pretty standard smartphone here in the West. Um, and before we designed everything, we tried to have a perfect map that helps us uh, like really plot the A to B points for how we're going to get there. Um, of course, like I said before, not everything can get covered in a set of wireframes. You will always have uh, little edge cases or content types that you end up uh, designing or finishing out or polishing in the browser, and that, that's normal. So I'll just run through uh, the different sets. 
this is the home page. So as you can see, this is the 960 view. You've got you know, horizontal navigation. We've got um, our uh, search bar up there at the top and the multilingual links, because that was part of the, uh, the client's uh, requirements. Um, we had our help section, a news feed, and then as you came down into the site, there were these uh, different, different sort of feed blocks. And at each point when we were planning out what these objects were, there was a dialogue about how these objects were going to reflow as content. Um, below those, below those uh, feed blocks, we've got the stay connected area, which is a way for people to uh, sign up for a newsletter information, which is a big part of uh, 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 disseminating information to certain bodies that they were used to uh, communicating with, and then also their social media links and other sites that relate to uh, how ICANN ICAN communicates. At the bottom here is an example of um, the uh, pinned uh, helper toolbar that's on the site. And uh, we had several features that we had initially thought about, but uh, we eventually pared down that uh, functionality to some very key things uh, for, the, for the launch. Here's what that same home page would look like in a tablet. Um, you may be seeing the gray bands in the background and thinking, well, this is, you know, um, what grid is, are you using? Well, for the 960, obviously, I, I used a standard 960 grid system to give me blocking and things like that. But as I collapse the screen, I'm using these uh, grid lines essentially just as reference. I knew what my, uh, my approximate range was going to be in the device window, and from there, I just came up with some uh, decent round numbers that would help uh, pare that down little by little. So I didn't use a specific framework to accomplish this. It was more just um, setting specific goals and using some, some pre-established ranges. So here on the tablet version, as you can see, the reflow of those blocks are now 50-50. They've got a little bit more breathing space for somebody who's going to be on a slightly smaller screen. And for the most part, this remains unchanged. Then once you hit the, um, the mobile view, um, we see kind of a, a pretty drastic change. Uh, around this time, the Boston Globe site had come out, and we were working, trying to find a good solution or an elegant solution to implement for how the main menu, the help, and the search uh, were all going to play together. And we thought what Boston Globe had come up with was so elegant and perfect that um, it would be something that we could try to implement ourselves. And um, it ended up being uh, uh, just a, a great a great site to draw information from and technology from, and uh, we learned a lot about it in that process. As you can see, that uh, menu is hidden, so when you tap the menu key, you get a pop out of the high-level navigation. Um, and then obviously, uh, the, the slideshow at the top and the, uh, uh, all the other supportive content has been turned into uh, a single column and just flows down the page. Um, some people might might have said, well, this seems like a lot of, a lot of uh, content for a smart device, but I think people are getting used to not really having a true fold, so um, we didn't think there was any reason to worry about them having to scroll a little bit to see all the information is there, because it's, it's all pretty uh, valuable for the, for the stakeholders. So that's that. Okay, so this represents a, a section that is a landing page. In the site, there's basically four layouts. There is the home page. Um, there are these landing pages, which have three columns. There are two column pages, which uh, make up the majority of the content. And then there are some edge pages, edge case pages, that have no columns and are full width. And each one of them is, was built on a grid and then um, worked down into each of these breakpoints. So I'll just quickly run through the, uh, the look and feel of each of these. So we've got the content flowing down the middle column in the desktop view. You've got your navigation on the left-hand side. And on the right, you've got uh, supplementary blocks for the context of that landing page. So if it's, the, um, if it's the blog, then obviously, you know, most recent comments or most recent posts might be a block that shows up there. And then, of course, the, the footer, uh, es essentially remains the same. Then when you move to a uh, tablet layout, we flop the position of um, the navigation and um, the content. It's a little bit easier for the reader to have their content sitting, there, sitting on the left hand of the screen, obviously, and then having the sub-page navigation to the right. And then just reflowed the 
other sidebar uh, blocks into that after, after the navigation. So that's the only real change there. And then with the, the excuse me, the, the smaller smart, smart device layout, you've got uh, the new navigation element up there. We removed the, um, we removed the sub navigation in the wireframes, but um, you, may, you may see a difference between what, obviously what I'm showing you in the wireframes and what the final product is because there's an iterative process that we go through. So this was uh, this brings me to the style tiles. Um, Samantha Warren has given us a bunch of really great tools now as designers uh, to go through the process of extracting visual information and communicating with the client their desires for what they want to see in terms of you know text and color and things like that and getting them buy-in. And <clears throat> excuse me. And the way that we're doing this is. We're creating tiles that's, that, that show a, a style or a theme without actually creating a full layout. And this gives you a chance to like go through all of the uh, descriptive process with the client, you know, asking them questions like, you know, what, how, do you de how would you describe your website? Uh, one of the questions we used was, if your website was a car, what kind of car would it be? And every stakeholder will have different ways of labeling those things and you have to be able to just go through the process so you can break it down to the the essence of what they want. So I'll just go through uh, those tiles real quickly and then at the last one will be what we landed on and what became the the platform or the guide for how we design the site. So as you can see we start with these light airy multicolors. Um, we had some some different ones that are a little bit more uh, funky or edgy, and um, you know we got we got good feedback on all of them, and eventually landed on uh, this, and so this became kind of the the theme or the idea that we were going to use to create the design, and this technique worked so well that by the time we hit the visual design, we did one comp, and we got buy-in, and that was it. It was really Awesome. I don't know how many of you are designers and have experienced, you know, oh, I, think, I think the client is bought into it and you show them the design and they're like, nope, that's not what we <laughs> asked you for. Um, try again. But this time we really got it. Uh, so I just want to add something yeah. to that point. Um, does everybody here realize how amazing that is? <laughs> that we delivered, oh, okay. That was, thank you. We were not soliciting applause. Please applause Samantha Warren for yeah. creating this technique. Um, the idea of essentially combining something like a mood board with a visual comp to give us some stuff that kind of looks like a website, but it's not. It's just a card, a, a tile that we can show the client. Um, to be able to get to that phase and have somebody look at your final Photoshop file and say, yep, you nailed it, great, let's move on, floored us as well. But that worked because we went through this style tiles exercise, and that was the point at which we had all these conversations like, oh, I don't know, this, isn't, this doesn't pop for me, or this one, you know, we, we have that fuzzy talk that, about how people feel about the design. Um, being able to, to, to get all that out of our system in a much more iterative way, in a smaller way using these style tiles, and then actually having a clear picture of what they want without having to go into Photoshop and manipulate every column and every bit of text and the logo and all of this stuff. We just do this one card and, and their imagination is limited to that and our canvas is limited, is limited to that. Um, so please, please, please Google style tiles. Um, the first result I'm pretty sure is Samantha Warren's website. Do read about it. It is an awesome technique. It saves a ton of time and money. So then after you've, uh, after you've done that and you settled on a tile, we went through the process of creating artwork for each of the major breakpoints and screen width. Um, and we use the style tiles, as I mentioned, as a guide for the artwork. And uh, for the re business requirements of this, I planned uh, the elements to use as few images as possible and really, really rely on CSS, modern CSS techniques to give the site life um, so that it would be very snappy. Uh, and the last part is anything you don't hit in that comp phase, don't be afraid to design in the browser. That's what it's there for. It is, it's the litmus test. It tells you the truth. So this is what we came up with for the homepage. 
Um, <clears throat> as you can see, it follows the, the pattern that we established in the wireframes to a T. Like there's no, like there was no bait and switch here. We've got every element as described in the wireframes, but with the style that they selected. And uh, here you'll see the, the state connected uh, block is collapsed. We use uh, uh, JavaScript to hide and reveal that. Then here we go at the tablet size. As you can see, everything is just as it was described before. There's all the elements popped out. And then finally for the uh, uh, smartphone. So yeah, that was it. And now I can hand it over to Chris. All right, so the uh, theme of DrupalCon is uh, collaborative publishing for every device. We've got a lot of that going on here. We had a great talk by uh, Lewis, who's in the room with us this morning, about the past, present, and future of responsive web design. Uh, pretty interesting stuff, and uh, you might um, be focusing on internet technology when you're doing this, but it really does apply to a lot of disciplines, and so it can be a challenge to try and use these constraints to your advantage as you uh, go ahead and, and start building for many screens. Um, so one of the first challenges that we uh, tackled was how do we build this? What should we use from the Drupal ecosystem? So the first question, of course, was to theme or sub-theme. <laughs> uh, when the project started, though, this was uh, over a year ago, uh, there were no good contrib sub-themes. Uh, so what we did was we just started from scratch and we decided we were going to go ahead and override any Drupalisms that we didn't prefer to use. And that meant that um, instead of trying to deal with both a contrib theme, uh, trying to unconfigure it, if you will, uh, we were only trying to deal with core. Um, so uh, that saved us a little bit of time and allowed us to spend more time optimizing and refining uh, our designs rather than working around a piece of technology that uh, we didn't really have any control over. Um, something that I'm very interested in here and uh, an advocate of is uh, feature detection, if you're not familiar with it. Um, feature detection is the next generation of user agent sniffing. It's the natural evolution. So um, if anyone has ever tried to browser detect on the server or detect a user agent, uh, which is what the technical term for it is called, um, you'll know that uh, sometimes that's a bit, little bit like uh, asking uh, for someone's name and then trying to assume that you know everything about them. So my name is Chris. Uh, there might be another Chris in the room, but we're probably not very similar. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, uh, you can ask someone, hey, are you uh, an extrovert or are you shy or something like that? And so you, you can actually get uh, more information about a particular person by you know, assigning personality uh, traits. And this is the exact same deal with a browser. So uh, you can ask a browser, hey, do you understand border radius? Do you know how to use um, CSS gradients? Do you know how to use geolocation? All of these browser capabilities can be identified and um, either utilized or stepped around if you don't, uh, depending on the answer, which is going to be a yes or a no. Um, so the library that we chose to use was Modernizer. Um, I, uh, I really like Modernizer, and I think it's a really easy way to uh, get, all this, get all of these questions, uh, suss them out of the browser. It, it basically just creates a big list of yes, no's for you and allows you to either, if the answer is yes, go ahead and use this feature, and if the answer is no, either ignore it or provide a fallback. It's up to you. Um, in some cases, you'll want to provide a fallback if it's a vital feature. And in other cases, you might want to just skip that piece of functionality if it's only going to add weight and decrease the performance of the website in general. Um, another thing that having all of these conditionals lets you do is to conditionally load other resources. So this is something that's a hot topic right now because especially when you're trying to progressively enhance a website, uh, what you need to do is sometimes just drop features off for people that don't need to use them and uh, add them for other people who would like to use them. Um, and we uh, ended up not conditionally loading anything on this website. There is one set of assets, but we conditionally applied some of the JavaScript because 
uh, I, in the end, when we kind of looked at the size of the scripts that we were loading, we decided that um, the performance hit of sending it down the line was not as bad as just loading it all and then asking a yes, no before you actually apply the JavaScript. So for one example here, I'm going to show you the uh, menu without JavaScript on a smartphone. And what happens here is that it's fully expanded. Um, so you can see that it says menu there, and then you've got the lists of links that are in the top level nav, and then you've got a search bar at the bottom. So all of this stuff just shows up if you don't have JavaScript enabled uh, on the particular device that you're looking at. And, and then if you do have JavaScript enabled, it starts in a collapsed format like we saw in the wireframes and the comp, but then when you tap one of the items in the menu, it goes ahead and expands it uh, for you so that you can use that particular feature. And so since most smartphones do have JavaScript, uh, this is a great way to save some screen size and uh, use that real estate for um, other content rather than just showing uh, top level navigation uh, over and over and over again as the user loads each of the pages. Um, another uh, set of libraries that we use was for responsive media. These are tricky problems which are not fully uh, solved yet. So you might hear things about responsive images. That's an unsolved problem at the moment. Um, we uh, analyzed some of the content on the website and found that they weren't loading enormous images to begin with. So there was no need to go ahead and try and add burden to the website by uh, loading small images first and then using JavaScript to load bigger ones if necessary. But technologies that we did rely on were uh, the FitFids uh, JavaScript library and Blueberry.js also. Uh, so let's look at one example of Blueberry here. Um, in the smartphone uh, layout of the website, you can see that the paragraph of the, uh, the description of the top slider here, the featured content that they had on the home page, uh, falls above, or the image falls below the text there. And then when you are looking at the desktop version of the website, they flow out and fill the grid uh, all the way. So. Uh, Blueberry is just a, a, a slideshow that, unlike uh, typical slide, slideshow JavaScript libraries, which require a fixed width, and then they um, basically use exact pixel values to uh, achieve the effects that they're going for, uh, Blueberry is a fluid uh, slideshow JavaScript library that allows you to implement this kind of thing in a responsive way. Chris, what is, uh, what is FitVids? And uh, FitVids is a, uh, just like you might um, uh, have guessed from the name, it allows you to fit videos within a grid, uh, a fluid grid, and it allows you to uh, shrink and squash video embeds, which is actually another tricky problem when uh, you're trying to load things in a, in a space that you don't know the exact dimensions of. So typical embed code says width 480, height 320, and then that's it. You know, if you change the size of the window, um, it's either going to fall off the edge or it's it's going to it's going to not fill the space. So obviously, you need a large source video uh, to make sure that you can fill the space, but it makes it much easier to squash down in that case. So one of the most important factors of uh, a responsive design is speed. Um, People are getting caught up right now with the technology here. It's, it's really cool technology. It excites me, and it's, it's a major evolution of, of web development in general. But when you start sending a ton of assets down the line, you can slow the website down because you're loading it for uh, multiple iterations of the website that people may never see. So um, a desktop user will use the fullest set of assets, but you know a mobile user is going to end up loading some of those assets after all anyway. And as Zach had mentioned, we uh, made a, a very uh, deliberate decision to not use images um, in many places w uh, where CSS was sufficient. And that allowed us to cut down on a lot of images, which in turn allowed us to not conditionally load assets, as I was mentioning before. So sticking with CSS3 when possible is a uh, really great move. And uh, for a lot of things like border radius or gradients or something like that, you're both saving bandwidth by not sending images down the line, and uh, you're also increasing the speed of the website just because it's uh, quicker to render CSS than it is to fetch an image and display it on a browser. Um, and again, we use Modernizer to enhance those uh, features of the website. So in some cases, when there was fallbacks that were uh, asked for, then we um, 
went ahead and used Modernizer to set up conditional uh, CSS rules that allowed us to put like small background images in where gradients used to exist. Um, if you've built a uh, if you've built a responsive website and you had to support IE, you might have heard of a little library called Respond.js. So uh, after analyzing and implementing it uh, during the course of development on the website, we decided to not use Respond.js to fix IE. Um, as we mentioned before, we only had one version to uh, correct for, and although the website does work and you can see all of the functionality on older browsers that don't support media queries, we decided that. Uh, taking the performance hit and adding the extra request to go and fetch Respond.js um, didn't seem uh, necessary at the end of the day for this uh, particular website. And the first thing that everyone should always do uh, when uh, going to optimize a website for speed is moving JavaScript to the bottom. Um, there are several ways you can do this. Uh, it's normally consequence free to just move dollar sign scripts, the scripts variable, down into the bottom of HTML.tpl or page TPL if you're in Drupal 6. Um, but there are also uh, other ways to do it using uh, Drupal add.js and, and uh, other template preprocess uh, functions. Um, I don't have any slides for this, but there's another challenge that I thought of while I was standing here talking, um, that we had to implement multilingual for this website. And so what that meant is that we have right to left languages in addition to left to right languages on the, on the site. Um, this has posed a particular challenge because uh, although Drupal has the infrastructure to uh, support RTL when needed, it will automatically load RTL files when it senses that they're necessary. Um, it still is a, quite a challenge to get everything to play nice and to make sure that you're writing very modular CSS that doesn't cause uh, position issues and uh, margin issues and stuff like that when you are building the website. So. Um, one thing that can really en enhance user experience, especially on touch phones, is that um, you want to have uh, no, uh, you don't want to have any elements hanging off the edge of your grid. Because if you do, then all of a sudden you can move the website side to side instead of just up, to down, up and down when, when uh, that's your only desired direction that you'd like people to scroll. And so RTL proved actually pretty uh, challenging to walk around this in some cases. So it's just something to keep in mind uh, if you ever have to develop a responsive, uh, um, a responsive multilingual website. And uh, that is it for me. So we're going to open it up for questions. Just before we do that, because we, um, we have plenty of time and we do want to leave plenty of time for questions, I think it's time to see it in action, right? Okay. <clears throat> so this is uh, the site in question. And you can check it out for yourself. <clears throat> so, for those of you unfamiliar with um, the responsive concept, and that I think is almost none of you, which is actually really cool, um, here we are looking at the desktop version. This is the tablet, and that is the uh, smartphone version of the site. So everything um, becomes big and touchable and, and uh, easy to work with. So you'll notice that we had to reflow some elements in the navigation. Uh, one of the business goals, again, was to highlight multilingual content, so we wanted to make sure that in all versions of the site that that multilingual content was um, up at the top of the page. So even though we had to hide the search inside the menu itself and you'd have to click on the uh, magnifying glass icon to expose it, um, we still wanted that multilingual content to show up so that people, um, so that uh, uh, Engl or French speakers, <laughs> English people can obviously read the site as is, but uh, people, French speakers and Russian speakers and uh, they have a way to get to that content right away on the site. Um, here is the search and the menu in action. So imagine touching on this with your finger. It exposes the menu. Um, that way we don't have this, on a smartphone when you load the site, the entire first page that you see isn't just a giant menu. You can actually see some content uh, right away, but you can access the menu very, very quickly. <clears throat> do you have Opera? I do have Opera. So we're going to take a look at this in Opera real quick. Oh, I don't want to download now. What do you want me to demonstrate? Go real small. Okay, we're going to go real small. So this is the real small version of the site. This is not smartphone size. This is 
sort of feature phone. I can't load media queries. I can't um, do a lot of CSS3 stuff. This is the very, very, very basic kind of site that you see um, when you're dealing with feature phones or if you have really limited bandwidth connections or, or something like that. This is what you see. So you can still use the site. You can still scroll through it with the little you know, Blackberry ball thing or side scroller or whatever, but you can still get through the site. Uh, it obviously lacks a lot of the bells and whistles, but all of this stuff is still there. We don't just give up on these people. Um, these people still need to access this information and they should be able to navigate the site in, in some way. So we have to switch to Opera for this because Chrome will only shrink so small. Uh, Opera will go almost all the way. So be sure to test your sites in Opera because in, if you're only doing it in Chrome, you're only gonna get this small and you're gonna forget that there are smaller screens out there and more importantly, there are screens out there or devices out there that don't support media queries. Okay, so questions, I'm sure you have some. Let us know what you have and if you could please come up to the mic, <clears throat> that way they can record the questions uh, for um, the video and things like that later on. Yes, sir. I have, I have two questions. Can you hear me on this? Uh, you're going to have to like get kind of up in it. I have two questions. Great. That's thank you. Okay. Uh, one is you mentioned that this was built like a year ago, uh, and then you had rolled your own theme. In hindsight, which in, the, knowing that there's like a ton of themes out there for responsive, would you have gone with one that exists, uh, exists today? So we did not launch this site a year ago. We started working on this site uh, nearly a year ago. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we launched the site uh, end of February. Okay. Yes, so um, I didn't actually catch the last part of your question. Could you repeat that? I couldn't quite hear it. So if you were gonna start on it today, if you were gonna redo the whole thing and do it today, would you have used, would, would you have used a theme that exists today? Um, if we had started it today, we'd probably have followed the same path um, because as I said, there's a lot of unconfiguring that you have to do. Many right. contrib themes are helpful uh, in that they provide drop-in solutions for users who are not as adept at dealing with this technology, but um, we were kind of on the front wave of this, and so um, I would probably have opted to do the same uh, type of build for this website just to f allow us to focus on front-end performance and uh, issues like that uh, regardless. Great. Um, in, is there any responsive specific modules that were used for this? Yes. Um, well, like I said, I actually uh, uh, wrote the Respond.js module while working on this site, and then we ended up not using it. <laughs> um, I also did not create but do maintain the modernizer module, and so some enhancements went into uh, a yet unreleased branch of it that uh, we did experimentally use on the website as well uh, to go, and go ahead and test them in a real-world situation. Um, and then finally, there's another one uh, called Responder that um, basically wraps media queries around core and module CSS so that you can build a website mobile first without having to deal with um, the CSS that's been created over the years in Drupal to deal specifically only with desktops. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, one point that's worth bringing up about Responder, um, not Respond.js but Responder, uh, is that Drupal uh, was not designed for mobile, and it wasn't until Drupal 7 was really about to be released uh, that uh, the whole mobile landscape sort of exploded, and now we have tablets and all these great smartphones and things like that, and people really started to adopt those devices. So a lot of the markup and CSS in core uh, is not only not optimized for mobile, but it just didn't even really know it existed at that point or that, that there was a thing that needed to be done with it. And a lot of the techniques that are now used that we are considered, that, that we consider industry standard came out just as Drupal 7 was in code freeze or um, after it was released. So Responder is a, a really great tool because it allows you to wrap some of that stuff into media queries so that you can sort of make Drupal core stuff responsive. There's also like, um, if anyone uses panels, which is a wonderful, delightful module. Uh, you can, you know, build layouts, basically, and uh, so if you go ahead and use like a flexible layout instead of one that's based on a grid system, um, it will hard code a bunch of pixel values into the markup, and while this works great on, you know, a one particular screen dimension, it doesn't work so well on, on lower, 
And so th that was kind of uh, where uh, the idea was born out of, which, which is there are all these great pieces of code that are created for desktop, but sometimes we just want to maybe remove some of them and uh, start with, with mobile and then add those back in as, the, as needed. So. Yes, sir. The fourth uh, screenshot that you showed us in Opera, I didn't catch that you wireframed that fourth one. Maybe I missed it, but right. that was actually something you had to CSS for and code for, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. So uh, actually, uh, as you know, as you may have noticed in the um, technical requirements, um, the the list of phones and operating systems that we were explicitly asked to support was a pretty modern set of requirements. Um, but we didn't want to completely ignore the fact that other uh, audiences exist, especially given the global nature of, of ICANN. So people um, using feature phones in Africa should be able to access the same content as iPad users in LA. Um, so we, we went ahead and, and created a baseline set of styles, uh, even though it wasn't explicitly requested. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if we actually went through the wireframing phase for that. We didn't go through the wireframe. Um, I mean, I did a bit of work to establish some of that baseline because I knew that it was going to be there and I knew that it was something that we were planning on implementing anyways. Mm -hmm. So when we started building out the styles for it, I had already been, or we'd already been testing <laughs> styles that were essentially like CSS crown floor that would be that baseline. Okay, another question, um, just what application did you use to site map out that, you had that nice diagram? Oh, that's OmniGrapple. That's for OmniGrapple. For all you folks at home who love to site map, OmniGrapple <laughs> is a great tool. It can be a little fussy sometimes, but. That's an understatement. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it definitely uh, makes that process a lot easier and it helps you visualize things. And the wireframing tool we, we used is Balsamic. So um, how many people here use Balsamic? Just a show of hands. How many people use Fireworks? Okay, so we're thinking about maybe adopting Fireworks as well, but Balsamic is really great because you can make changes live in this program uh, on the phone with a client, and they can be saying, yeah, but I, okay, it's kind of, think of a drop down, but when you select this thing, this, you get kind of a pop-up deal, and then we can say, oh, you mean like this? And you can pull together a Balsamic mock-up that actually illustrates their thoughts in literally in seconds on the phone. And that always really, really, really impresses the client because they think that's exactly what I wanted. That's awesome, you like read my mind. And no, we just have a tool that's really fast that allows us to visualize that stuff. Lucid chart is another one that just launched some wireframing online stuff. So. Okay, Lucid chart. Yeah. Lucid cool. chart, yeah. For site mapping. Uh, for wireframing. For wireframing, okay, yeah. great, thank you. I was wondering if over the course of the project you had to uh, run into the dilemma of uh, showing different content blocks based on what viewport was um, in view, and if not, uh, or for instance, showing one block for, uh, you know, tablet or making that block, make that content block be different for, you know, the mobile sides, and if not, what would the best practice be? How would you tackle that? Um. Hmm. It's specific, I'm pretty sure, specifically for this, uh, I'm pretty sure that we're not substituting anything. All the blocks are uh, completely flexible. So basically what we're doing is we're, we're using uh, percentage or fluid layout for anything that isn't specific. So we use percentages for that sort of thing just so that you can easily reflow all of the blocks. So uh, like a, a good example of this is like in that, that main slideshow that's in the, the header. There's actually uh, three three basic divs that are controlling how that layout works. There's one for the image that handles uh, setting its position and that background gray. There's one that's the box around the entire piece and there's one that's the content. And when it's a 960, those are fixed values. And then as the browser starts to shrink, those go from fixed values to percentages. So it allows you to reflow them um, pretty pretty quickly. And that that's the method I, I use, I realize that it's in, it's K-I-S-S, -S, you know, like keep it simple. So I, I think that, I, I, and we, I think we talked about doing some stuff where blocks are gonna be switched, switched out based on a, a context, but we never found a use case for it. We were able to accomplish all the layouts using just divs and uh, CSS. Hi, um, you guys touched on earlier the decision to 
keep all of the content on the home page, even in a mobile experience. Uh, I just am curious, was that a decision that was kind of based on your guys' philosophy that people do scroll, or was that a request from the client? Um, how did you guys reach that decision instead of just paring the site down to the basic functionality? Right. I think that was our decision. To leave the slideshow? Basically? Or to leave, yeah, basically all the content on the home page as opposed yeah. to pulling some stuff out. There, there was a request to um, definitely emphasize this featured content. Um, whenever they have a new program like new, TDL, new GTLDs or um, another conference or something, because they have three uh, yearly, or, or they have three conferences each year, um, each in a different country. And so they want people to be able to find out about those fast because just like a DrupalCon type situation, um, a lot of people only ever come to the ICANN site when they want to find out, you know, where they're going to be going, uh, you know, in, in two or three months or something like that so that they can uh, represent their country uh, when decisions are made about DNS and so forth. So for you guys, it's still on a site-by-site -site basis, just the importance of that information. N normally we would elect to show content regardless um, okay. unless it's really, really heavy images or something, but like I said, none of these images are enormous, and uh, so we elected not to use any like conditional loading to, to load them up after the fact. Cool, thanks. Yeah, really these images here uh, on the homepage, these are, are pretty representative of how big the images get on this site. So if we were dealing with some enormous screen filling image that we, we might be thinking differently about something like that. Hello, hello. 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 <laughs> um, this is more of a Four Kitchens question. Um, so I love the style tiles thing. I think one thing that's really difficult for agencies to do, and just anyone doing design on the web, is when you send a client a comp, is getting the right kind of feedback about that. Uh -huh. And you want them to talk about content, and they're talking about design, or you want them to give feedback on like the color scheme, and they're talking about, well, why is this? Why are these <coughs> items here in this menu? You're like, well, we're actually talking about design. We're not talking about this other thing. Right. Um, so. This seems awesome because not only does it save you time in that you don't have to go through rounds of comps, mm -hmm. but you get the right kind of feedback about what you want. Exactly. Um, so my question is like, was this the first time you guys had done this on a project? This and was the first time we ever used this on a project. Yeah. And yeah. it worked immediately. <laughs> yeah. This is awesome. I love yes. this. Um, and All so great. is this, do you plan to kind of use this process? This is on? absolutely part of our design process moving forward for the rest of our lives. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Yes. And Good really, stuff. And, uh, and Tom mentioned this before. Really, Samantha, you should. You right. Should, Phase two. Yeah. You should buy Samantha. Specifically, Warren, Samantha Warren. I can't say yes. Please it. buy her drinks okay. and all kinds of prizes. Maybe <laughs> vacation. She is really. She. Um, this is hers. Right. Yeah. Right. This is not ours. This is hers. Right. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Thank and at, at, now, since we're on the subject, um, maybe to dive just very briefly into. Um, more of the process behind style tiles because it's not just creating a bunch of these things and showing them to the client. There's actually a conversation we have in advance where we um, we ask them to go home or you know to their offices or wherever, um, go back to where they're from and think about the words that they would like to describe what they want their website to be. And we ask at least three people at the company this. We asked our product owner who was um, also sort of a stakeholder, and then he also clued in two stakeholders, and they came up with a list. And we would get things like, um, we asked specific questions too. Mm -hmm. If your website were a car, what kind of car would it be? Um, and then we said, use some adjectives to describe, use some verbs to describe, things like that. Samantha Warren describes all of this stuff on her website, the good questions to ask and things like that. That's how we arrived at these words that you see at the bottom here, if I can find my cursor. Where did you go? Anyway, bottom right, you see these adjectives or notes, right? So we have these words, thank you. Um, we have these words at the bottom of all of these style tiles. So this one says mini, cooper, inclusive, pluralistic, universal, cool, new, interesting, heart slash soul. So we took all of these words and we split them up into three categories. Um, and this is also what Samantha recommends. Um, they were, um, I think, conservative, middle, and extreme. and extreme. So we took all the words that they gave us and we sorted them into three different categories. And we wanted to create, and this is not representative of how many style tiles we actually did. I think we actually went through about 10 or 12. Yeah. Um, so we did about three or four rounds of style tiles, three apiece, until we slowly narrowed and zeroed in on the, the final one. Um, so one, of the, one stakeholder said, well, if my new iCan.org website were a car, I'd want it to be a Mini Cooper. 
And then we'd ask them, well, why? Because we took this list of words and we would ask them, why this? What do you think of when you think of this? What made you say this? So we write all these notes about the words that they're doing. We go and we make the first round of style tiles and then we listen to them. We send them the style tiles, they think about it for a day or two, and then we get on the phone and we say, all right, style tile one. How does this make you feel? What elicits um, some of your feedback about what you think this does or does not say about your organization? And we have a list of you know, does and does not. And that allows us to, um, like there was one style tile uh, in particular that they just said, this is just a complete miss, skip. And we were like, okay, but why? Hold on, why, why, why? And they, they talked about like, well, it's kind of monochromatic and like, okay. So you want to constantly elicit this feedback. And this may sound familiar because this is the same kind of conversation that we're usually having when we're dealing with enormous Photoshop files, right? Homepage comps and content comps. But if we limit it to this 1024 by 768 image and just show color swatches and words and things like that, it moves a lot faster. Um, so that's a, a little deeper dive into the method of style tiles. And I think Samantha is going to talk about this sometime in the next couple of days. So please look that up. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, it's a UX question. I did a little test drive of the site on my iPhone and my iPad, and you can't zoom out of it on iPhone or the iPad. And I was curious if that came up in the discussion with the stakeholders. You know, what if I wanna zoom out to get a bigger font? my tablet or anything like that and you know if it came up or you know have you been asked to do something like that and is it hard to do in responsive mode can I ask one question about your question are you referring to zoom out as in taking your fingers at the edge of the screen and moving them inward to make the site smaller um, actually to make it bigger so you know I would consider that zooming in that's Zo what I was asking you forgive me <laughs> so um, yes uh, the we set user scalable no on this website um, and actually, I've had conversations about this very recently, uh, and some people would consider that to be um, a, a constraint that is undesirable. Um, just like re being able to resize text on a website, uh, some users would always prefer to be able to zoom into it and look at elements that they may not be able to read. And so um, that's actually a very quick fix, but uh, in particular, this website uh, was shipped that way. Uh, and one more question. Um, I, I was talking to Earl Miles yesterday about responsive in panels, and, and he had some suggestions about how it could be implemented and how you could do it. And I was just curious if you would just avoid that at all costs. If I would avoid using panels? Using panels to, to build a responsive design. No, I really like panels. So if I said something that sounded like I didn't earlier, <laughs> No, no, I, 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 I yeah. wouldn't want to put words in your mouth. Um, I guess so just panels uh, offers a lot of tools. It, it, it can do so many things. and. So one of those things that I've actually been experimenting with and kind of kicking around internally is uh, using it to fake ESI, uh, edge side includes, so that you can like load blocks of content and simulate what uh, we kind of refer to as uh, rest-based requests. So um, uh, nothing solid yet, but it, it's one solution that might be possible using panels because then as someone was mentioning, uh, you can load a web page and then conditionally load more content uh, based on contexts that are in uh, panels and so forth. So I would say that panels is probably one of our shining examples of a tool that can be repurposed to enable more uh, intelligent responsive development within Drupal, um, at least until uh, we get all the whiz bang that's going to be uh, the I initiative formerly known as Whiskey in Drupal 8. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we have time for just one more question. Okay, well first, I was gonna say, if you're looking for other tools, uh, I use mockflow.com, that's another Mock one. Mockflow, mockflow. Um, and you can set it up with actions so people can actually walk through and see how different screens go. Bosalmic does allow that as well, and Fireworks, uh, I think, too. Right. Um, that was such a good question, answer on panels, I almost forget my question now. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I was gonna ask, um, so you said you wouldn't use, you would just do it from the base up again. And then, um, are there any particular techniques, like um, you're saying you'd use panels, you're saying you'd build it from the base, from the ground up again for a new theme. Um, so would you start from that small and build up again if you're gonna do this all over again? And um, I guess, is there any other hints you could get, like, so you really are saying you wouldn't use any other themes and you just build from the ground up? Um, yes, and that's, a custom that maybe just 
that that's our custom at Four Kitchens. Uh, oftentimes, we just don't um, have the room to use a contrib theme because it would get in our way more than help us. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, lots of, of themes do their job very well in that they enable tens of thousands of people to use Drupal um, beyond what they would be able to uh, use it for tasks that are beyond possibly their development capabilities or something like that. So, um, and I, so our choice not to use a contrib sub theme uh, or a base theme rather um, is not a knock at any one of those fantastic themes, but rather a preference that we have for front end performance and so forth. That, um, that's, uh, generally speaking, at Four Kitchens, we don't use, um, we don't sub-theme unless we're building a, um, a platform or an architecture that will use a sub-theme that we are also producing, uh, or a base theme that we are also producing. And the reason for that is just simply the kinds of projects that we take on. So if we were a high volume shop, we would probably be sub-theming because we need things to be rapid and um, uh, easily maintainable by, um, um, well, anybody else at the company, for example, or um, it, it's a trade-off. It, it kind of becomes a, a bit of a business decision, a bit of a, a technological architecture decision, but uh, our, our typical projects last a minimum of six months and sometimes years. So when we're dealing with projects of that size and we only do five, six projects a year, um, the sheer size necessitates that we build things, generally speaking, from the ground up. All right, well, thank you very much. We appreciate you coming. <laughs>